Good afternoon. Welcome. We've got um, 20 people in the room with us this afternoon, which is excellent. Um, I'm Darren Palmer, and I'm going to be facilitating the, this information session this afternoon. Um, a bit of a housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, the chat function of this webinar is not being monitored. So if you have questions as we go through, please use the question and answer function on the taskbar uh, of, of the webinar. And then we'll collate the questions and answer them at the end of the presentation, which should, with a bit of luck, uh, take 10 to 15 minutes. And um, we'll be able to answer questions at the end of it. Remember, the point of the session is to provide an overview of our draft walking and cycling strategy and to answer any questions you may have before you make your submission. A reminder that full copies of our draft walking and cycling strategy are available on our website and hard copies of the document are also available from all of our service centres and libraries. Uh, the draft strategy includes maps of towns showing how our road network may change throughout the district if we go ahead with this uh, with our strategy or when we go ahead with our strategy, depending on the feedback from you people making submissions. Our presenters today are Claire Scott and Drew Bryant, who have been instrumental in drafting the plan. Uh, they're both members of our service and strategy team. Uh, Claire is a transport planner and so is Drew. On the side is our transportation manager, Jamie uh, McPherson. Jamie will be there to answer any technical questions should there be any. Otherwise, um, he'll just sit back and enjoy the presentation uh, as I hope you all will. So without further ado, um, I'll pass it over to Claire and um, we can move ahead. So Claire, it's all yours, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Darren. Welcome everybody. Uh, as Darren said, I'm Claire Scott. I'm a transportation planner at Tasman District Council. And I just want to, along with Drew, give you an overview of the draft walking and cycling strategy. I won't be going too much into depth. I'm assuming that you've probably had a chance to at least look at it a little bit um, on your own. So if you can just bear with us and save your questions up or put them in the question answer function like Darren said. So just as a real quick, um, sort of umbrella statement, the strategy is intended to help guide the long-term development for a safer, healthier, and more environmentally friendly transport system that helps cater for growth over the next 30 years in our urban areas across Tasman. So uh, sort of making up the, the spine of the strategy is four key goals. So if we could go on to the next uh, four key goals, maybe skip to the next one. I think they've gone reverse order. So four key goals or outcomes that we would like to get out of the proposed, um, the proposed actions in the strategy. So the first one is looking after our environment. So this is, you know, thinking about um, emissions reductions and the massive impact that land transport has on the emissions in our district. So that's the first goal. Second goal is improving network capacity. So that's a very growth related goal. We know that the population of Tasman is expected to increase dramatically over the next 30 years. And our network can only handle so many vehicles. If we're going to be able to cater for this growth, we're gonna to need to look at um, using other ways, namely active transport, uh, in order to get around for everybody to be able to travel from A to B. Uh, the third goal is supporting healthy communities. So this is really a key co-benefit of walking and cycling, um, getting around outside of a car, you know, by, by making it safe for people to get around in other ways, we can help um, support those suffering with asthma, have cleaner air, um, reduce the um, occurrences of diabetes and things like that. The fourth goal is creating a vibrant urban environment. So we want to make sure that going forward, the areas in, uh, in the urban areas across Tasman are fun, enjoyable, livable places to be, both in the town centers and residential areas. So underpinning the whole strategy are three principles. Um, so everything that we do in the strategy, all our proposals kind of link back to these three principles. The first one is safety. So we're not just talking about safety for vehicles, we're talking about safety for everybody. So all transport users, whether pedestrians, cyclists, mobility scooter, skateboard, vehicles, everything, everybody needs to be safe. And 
the main point that I kind of want, the, the point of difference with safety, so we've talked about safety for a long time, but the point of difference here is that we're now talking about perceived safety as well as actual safety. So instead of just looking at crash statistics to see if something is safe enough, we're looking at how people feel about themselves and their loved ones using a certain part of the network. So safety, livability is our second principle. So everything that we do, we want to make sure that as we do it, we're improving the look, the feel, the amenity, and the social opportunities um, in both our town center urban areas and also our residential environments. And you'll see how the actions in the strategy link back to this as Drew takes you through those later. The third principle is affordability. So we have a lot to do in order to achieve our goals. And we want to make sure that everything that we do, all the improvements to the active transport network and all of our improvements to safety are done in the most cost effective way so that we make sure we're getting enough bang for our buck um, with all of our projects. So if we can go to the next slide here, um, the last thing that I wanna talk about before we move on to Drew talking about the actions is to just explain our targets a little bit. So to start out, our targets are based on census data of journeys to work and school in the urban environment. So for example, in 2018, the census data showed us that around 19% of people in the urban environment, so outside of that 2K radius around the town centers, uh, made their trips to work and school by walking and cycling. So we're not actually talking about trips to the supermarket or to Mita 10 to get you know, your fruit trays for the spring. We're talking about these daily trips to work and school that just about everybody takes. And the reason we've decided to focus on that is twofold. Um, one is because that's the data we have. So it gives us something solid to measure our progress off of. And two, it's achievable. Those are trips where you're often not taking a huge amount of stuff with you. And, and it's also a really habitual thing. So it's a place that we can, it's a good starting point and it's a good thing that we can measure. So our targets for 2030, which link to uh, national and international targets as well and align quite closely with them, is to have doubled our active transport rates to work in school um, up to 40% by 2030. And then by 2050, we would like to see those tripled from what they are now. So up to 60% of journeys to work and school in the urban environment being made by walking and cycling. So those are our targets. And in order to reach those, uh, we've got a, a range of actions um, that cover everything from a cycle network to speed management. And Drew will take you through those. So thanks, Claire. So as Claire said, what we need to do is we need to look at our infrastructure, our cycling and walking infrastructure. So I'm going to talk uh, quickly about cycling first. So we want to create a network of uh, a cycling network uh, and and a key route cyc uh, cycling network. And uh, the biggest thing that we're going to do uh, to do that is create separated cycleways on 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 key routes. And the maps that are in the uh, walking and cycling strategy that you may have um, shows where they may be and they're shown by blue lines. But effectively, what we're talking about is actually putting in a barrier between a cycleway and the car lane so that they are completely separated from the car lane. Uh, also worth noting that they're separated from the walking or the footpath as well. Um, and so they are separated from all those two other modes to make them as safe as possible. Uh, to achieve this, um, our roads aren't as wide as we would want them to be to be able to accommodate that and everything else that we've currently got in our road environment. So we're proposing that almost every road that we have uh, a cycling lane in, parking will need to be removed to make, to make way for that. Um, these key routes also tend to go through our town centres. And our town centres, rather than removing all the parking in our town centres that uh, that, that shops and other people rely on. What we're, um, what we're putting forward is to create slow commercial areas. So that's slowing the speed of the traffic down to 30 kilometers or less, um, so that cyclists actually have the lane just as much as a vehicle going through the town. So an example of this for, is, is Richmond. So Richmond is, has a 30 
kilometer an hour speed limit. Uh, we know from monitoring that the actual speed of vehicles going through that is much less than 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and, and it's in that type of environment that a bike can actually take up the lane and vehicles will have to travel behind it just like they would another car. Uh, our secondary routes is going to be made uh, as the connectors that connect to those key routes. Um, uh, and they will tend to be your first sort of part of your journey or your last part. We don't want to ignore that because they're a really key part of anyone's journey. Um, but also it's really difficult to make sure it connects everyone. So we can't have cycle routes or separated cycleways to everyone's home. So what we're looking at doing is in our residential streets, in our urban residential streets, we create greenways, which are again, like the commercial streets, are a slow speed area. And, and they bring the, uh, the speed of general traffic down to similar speeds to what uh, cyclists uh, are at. Now that means that cyclists use the road, they don't use footpaths, they, they use the road in those uh, rural environments, uh, sorry, in those urban residential environments. Um, look, we've also got to acknowledge that we already have a network of shared paths. Uh, shared paths. Uh, the Great Taste Trail is a really good example um, of that, but there's other places that we've got around our district. And we don't want to ignore those. They're a key part and, and they will continue to be a key part. They, um, they will act as shortcuts and ways to be able to uh, get through uh, areas quick, quicker than, than you might do by road or through the greenways. Um, but we also want to recognize that they're also where pedestrians spend a lot of time. So we don't want to make them the primary route, we want to make them secondary route. That means that they tend to be a slower speed environment to take into account the, uh, the needs and the concerns of pedestrians. So for pedestrians, uh, we just recognize that we've already got a, a relatively mature pedestrian or footpath network around our towns. Um, that's not taken away from the fact that there needs to be maintenance and trimming back of, of foliage and things like that. But one of the things that we've uh, identified is that where um, that people need to cross the roads and the, the road crossings are creating quite a, a lot of barrier for people. So we're talking about in the strategy that we actually need to create these safe crossing points across major roads uh, on those key walking uh, routes. And then again, just like uh, cycling, um, the shared paths are going to play a critical part in the pedestrian network as well, again, to create those shortcuts and, and it's a more uh, tranquil place. Uh, just acknowledging that a lot of our shared paths currently go through recreational reserves. Uh, so as you've heard me talk about, um, slowing traffic down is going to be a key part of that. So speed management is an aspect that is, features fairly heavily in the strategy. I've already talked about the neighbourhoods or the greenways as we call them. I've already talked about the town centres. But what I haven't talked about is schools. So um, government is putting through some changes around speed management. And one of their proposals, uh, which is fairly advanced, is that they want to slow speeds down in front of schools. Uh, so in urban areas, they're talking about 30 kilometres an hour. And it's not just in front of schools, but it's on school routes as well. Um, so that will be part of the strategy as well. We're, we're trying to take those directions that we're getting from central government into account with us. Uh, another element is the urban design of our towns. So as our towns grow, um, they have been growing outwards uh, for quite some time. Um, and that tends to put people further away from the areas that they want to go, the areas that they shop and they go to school and other things like that. So there's two elements to this. Uh, two elements that we're wanting to move forward in the strategy. One is the housing and actually just trying to put some density of housing closer to those, those key areas that people want to go. So it's called intensification or infill, but it's actually just having the right type of housing close to amenities. The second part of it is where we do have our towns that are spreading, uh, spreading a bit further away from the main town centres, is to actually create some clustered or you know, some hubs or clustered services, as we'll call them here, um, that effectively tries to put those key elements that people use on a daily basis close to where you live. So it's got places of work, it's got recreation, it's got shops, it's got schools, it's got key um, public transport hubs and things like that. So that um, for a majority of the things that you do, it's within easy walking distance and certainly within easy cycling distance. 
Now, that was all the infrastructure to sort of create these, uh, these routes. But we, we need to just acknowledge that it's not just all about creating these routes. There's other things that we need to do as well. One element of that is creating or adding cycle parking. Um, and, and so we want to uh, put a lot more cycle parking in so that parking your bike is easy and it's close to the destination of where you want to go. But we also uh, need to acknowledge that um, in places there's going to need to be a, a denser amount of cycle parking because it's a, a place of key interest. And that might be around uh, a key bus stop location. Um, it could just be around some places that a lot of people work. Um, so we, we're talking about shelters in some clustered areas for uh, cycle parking where there's a lot of interest. These are very similar to what Nelson's got in front of their council building. Uh, also worth mentioning with shelters, it's not just shelters for bikes, but it's shelters for people um, to get out of the rain, uh, to get out of the sun. And that leads us on to the seating as well. So uh, shelters and seating can go together uh, to create those elements. Um, but seating is also about just giving people an opportunity to stop and take rest, especially if their walk is, is some distance. Uh, it also allows for some community aspects to it as well. And it's, it leads to that, that, um, uh, that principle of, of creating better urban environments. Uh, another element, we call it uh, travel demand. I'm sorry, that's a very council way of saying things, but effectively it's to do things that are not infrastructure to encourage people to walk or cycle. And the three aspects that we want to point out here is one of them is travel planning. Now we're already doing that, um, but we want to continue to do it. Uh, travel planning is working with schools and workplaces uh, and, and understanding how people are getting to work in school and actually uh, working with them to encourage their, their students or uh, employees um, to be able to do that. And that may mean um, just making some small changes to help facilitate that. Uh, campaigns like the Go by Bike Day, um, we want to continue to do that. It's just encouraging people in a more general sense um, to, to see it as, as a viable option. And then just education as well. I, again, I, I leave back to schools, but it's working with kids, but also working with those that want to be able to walk a cycle, but just don't have the confidence to do so. So I'm going to hand back to Claire just to talk about uh, how these actions that I've just talked about will play out over the next bit. Great, thanks Drew. So as you can see, we have planned these different actions to happen over really the next 30 years, which is the time frame of the strategy. And we split, split the actions up for now into short-term, medium-term and long-term actions. These are largely based around funding limitations, but they could change based on feedback from the community, submissions that people like yourselves put in, uh, telling us what you'd like to see happen, and also additional funding opportunities that may come up over the coming years. So over the short term, we have some things like um, new and improved footpaths, starting up with that school and workplace travel planning, uh, and painting the cycle lanes. So I know we talked about separated cycle lanes, but because that's more of a, uh, that's a larger infrastructure investment, we want to start off by at least starting to get the community used to that change in road space. So you may see uh, some cycle lanes being painted first, uh, and then as the funding comes in, them turning into separated cycle lanes in the medium term. In the long term, we have the continuation of all these projects, but also things like starting up, um, making more shared paths around the district. So we have one more thing to talk about, which is the maps at the end of the strategy. So this is actually a really important part of the strategy because it lays it all out there and it lets you look at your key area of interest and see what's planned, what's being proposed um, for the streets around where you live or work or what community you represent. So I'm mostly just gonna take you through the key. So the legend there on the side so that we're really clear about what everything means. So the dotted blue uh, line represents shared paths. Now, some of these shared paths are already there. They're already in existence and some of them are planned for the future. And you can see them cutting through residential areas and also running along the coastline and things like that. Um, and as Drew said, we're not intending shared paths to be um, the, 
the spine of the cycle network. They're more of a slower speed shared zone with pedestrians. Um, but they do imp provide important links through these residential areas, as you can see. So the solid blue line is the separate what the, the roads that are intended to have separated cycle lanes. And as you can see there, it has the no parking sign on there. So across all these maps from Brightwater, Wakefield, Motueka, Collingwood, Richmond, all the urban areas, there are some area there are some streets that are already indicated that road space will need to be changed so that um, the existing road space can be shared more equitably between vehicles and other modes of transport. So those are all indicated on the maps there. The green line is all those greenways that Drew was talking about. So those are those residential slow speed areas uh, that are that first or last kilometer of your journey at the end or beginning of the day. And you can see a lot of shared paths cutting through those. So those are all intended to drop down to 30 kilometers an hour. The gray is the, is the town center, which is that another slow speed shared zone. The orange are roads that are intended to stay at 50 kilometers an hour. And as you can see, there are very few roads around that are intended to stay at 50 kilometers an hour and do not also have a shared path. I mean, a separated cycleway along there with that. And then the red is simply your state highways. So those are the keys. You can look at that more, uh, more at your leisure and provide and um, provide specific comments about your area in your submissions if you like. Um, so a little bit more about the feedback. As Darren said, there's a few ways that you can provide feedback. You can get a paper copy uh, at the Richmond office and all service centers around Tasman and also at the public libraries. Uh, you, and attached to that is a free post submission uh, form. You can also look it up online. Uh, if you search in walking and cycling strategy, it can sometimes be a little bit hard to find. Apologies for the system. Um, but if you type in walking and cycling strategy at the Tasman website, you should find it. And you can provide your feedback there as well. Uh, submissions close on the 7th of March. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. And I'll give it back to Darren now to manage the question and answer time. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, things got a bit broken up at the uh, in, at the end there, and in, in my but it is the seventh of March at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. A few questions that we have that um, people have have put through. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can actually see the questions. Can you see the questions, Claire and and Drew? Um, one is uh, principally looking at the urban centric vision of this uh, particular strategy and can you comment on uh, how it fits with sporting re reduced vehicle kilometers tra uh, traveled and access to amenities from areas like those of unplanned growth uh, the low density sprawl across the military hills and um, planned growth in the long-term plan um, areas like supplejack valley uh, where is the council sort of multi-factor uh, analysis has identified a, a lack of employment um, but I just think uh, if we could have a bit of a description, this is principally urban focused, isn't it? There's been a, a couple of questions about that. Sure, I'm happy to answer that uh, a little bit more. So as Darren said, this is this was intended to be an urban strategy. And I can completely understand, um, and I'm expecting quite a bit of comments about those more rural areas and connections from um, towns that are further afield or you know smaller communities that are starting up. The reason why we focused on um, those urban journeys is partly because of that uh, intensification and also because it's measurable. That's the data we're getting quite clearly and that's also a reasonable distance for people to walk and cycle to work in school. And we wanted to make sure that the the kind of the, the gist of the strategy was achievable and realistic. Um, we know that people are gonna struggle to uh, walk and cycle a lot of people further than five kilometers to, their, to, to work in school. And so we wanted to keep it small and manageable. We know that a bulk of those urban trips are actually under three kilometers. And those are the ones we really wanted to focus on. Um, there are, however, adjacent um, strategies and plans in place that are on the go, um, such as our public transport plan, which will be providing better public transport services um, from 
Motueka and Mapua, for example, into Richmond. Um, and also Drew sp spoke about those clusters um, that are being built out where there are developments currently being built and in the works for 10, 20 years from now. We know that you know, traveling from, from further field into Richmond is gonna really increase those vehicle kilometers on our roads. And that's why we're looking at kind of making more self-sufficient uh, mini towns around the district so that you do have access to school, food, um, activities, everything that you need in your daily life much closer to home. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Drew? Yeah, if I could add, um, but we haven't, was clear as right, we, we have focused on the urban centres because that's where we're going to get the best bang for buck. Uh, we talked about earlier that one of the key things was affordability and in terms of getting the most people to be able to walk or cycle as part of their daily routine, it's in those urban centres. Now we haven't forgotten about rural, it's just not a key part of where we're concentrating on this. Um, and the Great Taste Trail already has some of those uh, rural connections already. Um, and you will note that we have shared paths uh, is in that uh, timeline, if I can go back to it here. Um, sorry, so we way back, but we've got shared paths, but they do feature um, later on. Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, you notice that the shared paths feature later on in the strategy, and that's because uh, and the shared paths are going to be more in that, uh, that rural area, but, but they're not going to give us the, the, the level of change that we're going to get out of the urban areas. So they're not forgotten about. Um, we do have links on the maps that you see leading out of town, um, but it's just not a key feature of, of the first part of it. But again, um, we, we look forward to getting feedback on that. And if that's something that the community uh, would like to see a bit more of and fleshed out, then, then that's something we'd like to hear about. Yeah, thanks, Drew. There's, there's been quite a bit of comment. I mean, it's, there's a lot of positive feedback. And thank you very much from those who are providing us with feedback through the question and answers. It's um, it, it's wonderful to, to have your input. There has been a lot of uh, comment and questioning about expanding this to to the rural environment and, and, and going further out. There's a there's another question here, um, Bevan. Uh, overall, the strategy looks good. However, there's likely to be pushback often from a vocal minority. Um, how can you expedite delivery on the ground? I think there are concerns um, uh, about that. And uh, will you use school and workplace planning to uh, inform that delivery on, on the ground and, and address potential hazards? How, how's that going to shape up into the future? So I can answer that. Um, so yes part of this consultation is going to be the consultation that we have with the community um to and, and once we've done this and and had a mandate we we are going to start on that straight away and you can see from the the um the graphs that i got up there that those painted cycleways happen straight away um the new and improved footpath is already happening the school and workplace travel planning is already happening um uh, if we get the mandate to do it, then we will start to work on those council plans and, and do those connected developments as well and start to look at those residential slow speed areas. So this is why this is quite key, the, uh, key is that this is going to be the conversation that we have with the community about these. And this is why we've got maps in our strategy uh, and we've um, we're identified what type of infrastructure we're going to have on different routes is so that um, so people are very aware of what we're talking about at different locations. Great, thanks, Drew. Oh, Claire, you, you yeah, comment? yeah. I'd like to add to that, especially um, a question uh, point two of the question from Bevan, talking about will workplace and school travel planning inform the delivery on the ground? And I just noticed that uh, Peter Verstappen put a comment in in the chat as well about adding crossing safe crossing points across the uh, state highway in Wakefield, which which is a key school route. Um, the answer is definitely yes. That's a that's actually a really key point of workplace and school travel planning is to look at where are the students or employees coming from? What are routes that make sense for them that aren't all meandering out of the way, but direct uh, desire line routes for students and staff? And then using those to inform where we actually need to make sure we put in those safe crossing points, uh, as well in that walking scootering network that Drew talked about. Um, the actual 
crossing points that need to be upgraded aren't included in the strategy in the maps at the moment. That's going to be a work in progress to identify through that workplace and school travel planning process and conversations with the community to find out where are those really key places that make sense to put in safe crossings. A quick question too about some of the pathways. Um, the dotted blue lines go across private land. Uh, I'm not sure uh, plans for acquisition, are uh, we going to look at purchasing more land for or is it um, just the, the blue lot dotted lines aren't actually um, crossing private land? I, I don't believe that is. What, Claire, what, what is that? Yeah, no, at the moment, we, there are no plans for land acquisition in particular places. Um, perhaps Jamie McPherson would like to speak more to that on what the process would be down the line if that were to, to happen. Before Jamie jumps in there, uh, just to, to point out that, yes, you're quite right, some of the dotted lines do cross private land. Um, those uh, more often than not line up with uh, what's in the council's uh, resource management plan for some sort of access way. So it might be a stormwater corridor or something else that we've already got planned within our, um, our resource management plan. So we've got a high degree of surety that something there or close by will allow, allow us to be able to create those connections. I might just add to that, Kia ora, everyone. Um, yeah, it's really important that we um, define where we want these corridors to be, especially in an environment of rapid growth. So when developers are looking to develop their land, that there's a clear um, a clear signal that, that uh, some of their land is required for, you know, uh, vesting for walking and cycling purposes. So, you know, this is a really important part to get right. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. That, yeah, that, that covers a, a couple of other questions as well we have there. Um, there's one there about um, incorporating bus stops and where there's a separate cycle lane, uh, will it be large enough for a large bus to move on and off the road and not impede the separate cycle lane? Uh, what planning is there for, for that sort of, um, yeah, the, the bus stops? So I can speak to that too. So. Um, so that's a level of detail that we haven't got yet. We're at the strategy stage at this uh, point in time. But um, what's really key is, and what we haven't shown on, on the maps that we presented, but what we have got on our own internal mapping, is that we've must, uh, mapped out all the bus stops to make sure that these cycling and walking uh, pathways, or cycling in particular, pathways actually connect to those bus stops. So it can act as the, the last kilometer, first kilometer part of your, your bus journey. Um, but yeah, look, we we are ultimately you, we talked about earlier that we're separated cycle lanes, so we're quite keen on that. So so we are going to be using best practice with regards to to bus stops, cycle lanes, and footpaths to ensure that we're we're not uh, we're meeting the you know we're we're achieving all those different goals and doing it in a safe manner. Good stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wrap up shortly. Um, time is starting to get away from us. But um, there's uh, a, a question specifically in Motueka. Uh, it's in the process of state highway upgrade with lights, including turnings and pedestrians. The main road is narrow now. How are you going to fit in cycle lanes? That's one of the questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that one. Uh, yeah, so that area within Motueka falls largely within that town center area. Um, and that's actually not tagged for separated cycleways. You can see in Motueka High Street, it, most of High Street has that separated cycleway. But once you get into that area that's being upgraded right now with new lights and pedestrian crossings, that's intended to be a shared a mixed use zone. So the improvements there will be looking at really dropping those speeds in that area so that cyclists can share the lane with vehicles and that the traffic is slow enough that both pedestrians and cyclists feel safe in that area. Yeah, thanks for that, Claire. Um, just, uh, we've just got down to the last couple of, of questions. Um, there's one about using the shared pathways, uh, pedestrians, micro mobility, cycles, and conflict there. Uh, are we gonna look at things, or is this too detailed, but are we gonna look at things like speed limits or separation within those? There's a bit of concern that, that maybe there might be conflict. Yeah, I can speak to that. Yeah, you're quite right. It's something that we've um, we've been very 
careful about because, and that's partly why we've made the shared pass as the secondary network for cycling. So the primary or the most direct routes will be those separated cycleways. So they're the ones that if people want to get somewhere quickly as possible, that's the that's the routes that they take. Um, and we've made the shared pass is just a, a second element to that. So yes, it, it allows you to get to other places now and to take shortcuts. But um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll take that into account. Um, and, and part of that's going to be part of the design of the shared pass as well. Uh, but there'll be elements of, of just education. So, you know, we, we talked about and the actions, education around shared pass and things will be part of that as well. Thanks for yeah, thanks. So, yeah, go thanks. ahead, Jamie. Yep. Into that. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Um, this is also a national issue um, that the government have, have had a group looking at um, developing a new regulatory package um, that covers things like speed limits on footpaths and for various types of micro mobility devices. Um, so, we've, yeah, we've, we've had some input into, into, the government's process there. They've previously asked for, for feedback through consultation and we're still waiting for for that to play out so that there's perhaps some some new and better fit for purpose regulations governing that and then you know we can take that properly into account. Excellent. Hey, thank you very much, team. Um, that's that's it through through the questions. Um, so thank you, attendees, for, for coming along today. This has been recorded, this uh, webinar, and will be available on our um, Tasman District Council website in about 24 hours. It takes a wee bit of processing to, to get it on board. Um, a reminder, we are having another two um, uh, webinars. So if you want to jump back in and have a think about things or um, you can you can join us with those. The details are on our website for those. Uh, in the meantime, you make sure you grab a copy of the strategy or have a look at it online. And um, we will look forward to hearing from you. The uh, the deadline for submissions is four o'clock on Monday, the seventh of March. So um, please have your say, make your voices heard. But um, thank you very much for your encouragement that's come in through the question and answers. Really appreciate that, and I hope we've been able to um, help out and. Uh, help you make your submission on this so uh, until next time thank you very much from claire scott um, drew bryant jamie mcpherson and um, myself thanks for attending a couple of questions have come in during our presentation which are yeah worthy of addressing um the first one is about potential conflict on those shared walkways uh will e-bikes have speed limits i guess there's e-bikes you've also got your mobility scooters how are you going to cope with uh conflict on on the shared pathways I'm happy to speak to that. Yeah, that's a really good question and one that comes up quite frequently. Uh, shared paths always have that conflict between cyclists and pedestrians, and that's something we're very aware of and that we want to minimize. And part of the reason why there's a lot of urgency around creating this safe separated cycleways on the roads, on the key routes, is because a lot of those people on e-bikes who are going quite quickly on the shared paths right now and giving people a fright, um, a lot, you know, potentially running over leads with dogs and things like that, are people who would actually prefer to be on the road, um, getting from A to B in a really direct route. But currently, it doesn't feel safe to cycle on the roads. So the proposals in the strategy are meant to actually reduce those incidences of uh, conflict between pedestrians and cyclists on the shared paths. Um, but as of right now, there's no speed limit as such indicated for e-bikes on shared paths, but a lot of that's going to be in the design and also in that education aspect and campaigns that Drew talked about and really sending the message to the public that uh, etiquette and being kind and patient is really important on those shared paths. Another question has come through about um, rural networks and rural cycleways. Uh, you're looking at the Motawaka Valley uh, Highway as a potential area for um, cycling, making it safer. Um, residents in that rural area are concerned with um, high-speed traffic um, up to you know 80 k's and large trucks. Is is there consideration? What what about the rural side of it? Or is this purely an urban focus, uh, Drew? Yeah, uh, thanks, Darren. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, one that we've given a lot of thought to. Look, we've got to go back to our core principles that we talked about at the start, and one of them was affordability. So uh, when we look at affordability, um, 
trying to put the infrastructure down that gets the most people walking and cycling is to meet those targets is, is what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so we have focused on the urban areas because that's where we are going to get the best bang for buck. That's not to say we haven't uh, haven't forgotten about rural areas. We just haven't mapped them out, out the same. Um, what you might have seen in a couple of slides back when we talked about when we're going to do what, you saw there was a bunch of shared paths. And that was a little bit later on because we wanted to get the, the urban stuff out of the way first. Um, it's not that we've forgotten about shared paths in rural areas. We just want to, to get the priorities right. And when we've got a limited amount of funding, we want to prioritise that first. Um, we didn't put it on the maps because we didn't want to set that expectation, but that's not something we've forgotten about. And uh, just internally, we do have uh, in our own minds a network of, of cycleways that we want to connect rural areas together. Um, this is a question that's come up a fair bit in this uh, consultation. So it might be something that we do take on board as, as part of developing this uh, walking and cycling strategy. Yeah, and a follow up to that, maybe Jamie could help answer this. Um, there's a suggestion that a relatively inexpensive strategy would be to enforce slower speeds on, on the bends, particularly in the Motueka Valley, focusing on that, or putting up sides, uh, signs along the roadside alerting to drivers to slow down for cyclists. Is that something that's been considered? Is, is that uh, on the books, Jamie? Well, yeah, well, good question. Yeah. There's a much bigger conversation happening about speeds. Um, you know, that's across our network, both rural and urban. And so, you know, another significant piece of work that the team here will be doing this year, once this walking and cycling strategy is, is um, through the process, is working on our speed management plan. So there's kind of a bigger answer to that question. A, a shorter answer is, um, while many rural speed limits that are currently set at 100, we know are not safe and appropriate for, for those roads, um, and work's been done to, to review what safe and appropriate speeds are for those roads, the, the speeds will still be relatively high compared to what most cyclists feel comfortable with. Um, and so, you know, it, it gets, starts getting really um, not feasible to, to slow people down, to slow vehicles down and implement lower speed limits down to sort of 30 or 50 on these rural roads um, in any meaningful way. The, and the subject of signs, yeah, the, you, you know, there's so many risk areas out there that you, you just can't possibly put in enough signs to, um, to even touch the sides. And the more signs you put up, the more people ignore them. So it's, um, you yeah, know, the... The options available to us in those rural areas are really limited and what what we would prefer to do is is a bit what we've done with the great taste trail you know building a building a a a, a, a trail that that allows people to, to travel and what we would love to extend that um, and you know pick up more of our sort of rural residential communities um, and get them sort of onto the network so that's certainly a goal as claire said so um you yeah, certainly can to get submissions along those lines so that that can all be you know put in front of our politicians and funders. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Uh, another question's come through about uh, redefining. Uh, are you redefining preferred routes through towns uh, uh, with the urban slow zones? For example, would you or should you or should traffic use the orange 50k routes through the likes of Takaka and Brightwater? And are there plans for a proper bypass for Motueka? Now, the Motueka bypass, I think, is a, a different issue on this. But um, the, the question of, of the uh, slower zones through Takaka, through Brightwater, where, where does that sit? Who would like to pick up that question? Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. Sure. Uh, yeah, short answer is yes, we do want to cut down on people using uh, neighborhoods to, to get from A to B quicker. Um, we are intending that car traffic does go through on those key routes, especially that are still indicated as 50 kilometers an hour. Uh, a lot of those do cut through some town centers and you know, that's part of what we're looking at is just sharing our road network more equitably between cycling and driving. And there will be times when 
this is a route that cars go through, but it's also going to be slower because we're making it safe for cyclists as well. Um, so that's the intention. There may be situations where drivers will have the opportunity to not go through towns, not go through town centers at all um, if they're going past that town and they're not going into it. And that would definitely be encouraged. Um, that would support our goal of creating more livable, uh, vibrant urban environments as well. Thanks, Claire. Uh, final question as it stands at the moment before we wrap things up is, does the concept of healthy communities include social well-being where people can meet in each other's homes and what parking will be available for that? Um, uh, Claire, again, I guess that's in your direction. Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing to be really clear about from the beginning is that um, this the proposed um, parking spaces that won't be available anymore are largely not through the bulk of those residential areas. So when we're talking about the, the green field, I mean, the, the greenways, the neighborhood greenways and the slow residential areas, we're not proposing removing all the parking from residential areas. So it's just along those key routes where the separated cycleway will be. And we're also keeping in mind that even people on those routes will have parking needs. And we are looking at, um, alternatives if need be if if what we're proposing is causing a severe parking shortage in any particular area there are some alternatives that we'll be looking at and that's in the strategy as well looking at um, potential inset parking here and there on these routes and also um, being close enough to side streets where there is parking available appreciate that thanks very much now that wraps up our questions that we've had from attendees um oh there's one more question it's not clear for example in richmond are the main routes of hill street salisbury wensley proposed to be 30 k's even though there is a separated cycle lane what's yeah what's the deal with that drew going back to those uh, uh those principles that we we're talking about salisbury road is one of those interesting roads that uh that has schools all over it and as we talked about um, speed reductions in front of schools is something that we're going to see coming through from central government. So that's why we haven't indicated that one as uh, as as, uh, as as staying at 50 kilometres an hour. Likewise, Champion Road also has a Garen College on it, so that's that's the same deal there. Um, one of the things we're also very conscious of is that Wensley Road, Salisbury Road, and Hill Street get used uh, for a lot of rat running. So people that live further south that are trying to avoid the three sets of lights. So, um, and and you can see here that we're, we're trying to encourage them more for uh, cycling and walking, um, particularly because they are on a route to schools. And so that's something that we're trying to do. You can see that we're trying to, uh, to give uh, vehicles priority to get down onto the state highway. And, uh, but, but sort of, I won't say discourage them, but just, you know, prompt them to use that rather than using those through uh, through Richmond routes like Hill Street, Salisbury Road and Wensley Road. Appreciate that. Thanks very much. We need to wrap up. We've, uh, we're starting to run over time. So thanks to presenters. Thanks to, to Claire, Drew and Jamie. Uh, for your time this afternoon. Thank you for the attendees who have come along and shown an interest in it. Our submissions uh, submission period does close at four o'clock on Monday, the 7th of March. And as we said earlier, we said a couple of times now, uh, you can make your submission online or you can pick up hard copies from our libraries and service centres across the across the region. Um, but that's it uh, from myself, Darren Palmer, from the Tasman District Council Communications team. Thank you very much. We will be back at seven tonight. So if you can think of any other questions uh, throughout the afternoon, feel free to join us. But until then, thank you. We have had a few questions come through, a few statements as well, which would be useful to be put into submissions to, to our proposal. Um, and, and you've already answered uh, one of them. There's a, there's a question here, the diagram called how we implement the strategy has specific timeframes. Therefore, it will have assumptions such as indicative investments required, for example, separated cycle lanes or town centre improvements. I do think you may have addressed this, but what are the specific assumptions used in producing the diagram? This question is important because the draft strategy focuses on high level goals and it's hard to see how it will be achieved. Now, I understand it's a long-term goal, we're looking at but um drew can you uh, answer how how uh, this this question uh yeah i think i can I'm, I'm just i should have actually brought the uh questions up so i can see this one because it's quite a quite a question basically um, how, how are you going to achieve these goals in the long term really uh financially and physically okay so what we've what we've had to do um and just uh, if you can recall that diagram so rather than me going all the way back to it i'll, I'll try and uh, I'll try and uh, describe it as best I can. 
but as you can recall, um, we we do we don't have an endless pot of money, and and so what we try to do is try to do a uh, a plan of actions that is affordable by the council. So we've started off by creating cycleways, and that's painted cycleways or buffered cycleways, and that's the initial step, and that gets us going. Uh, it gets people able to be able to have a space to be able to use on the on on the road, and then as time goes on, um, we convert those cycleways into those separate cycleways. So that's where it has something uh, in there uh, that separates it from the traffic lane. Of course, the the cycleways are already separated from the uh, pedestrians because because we're using the road space or the carriageway space. Uh, and then as time goes on, and I'm oh, sorry, and they're the key things we we believe that the, the cycleways are the, the key thing for being able to get people to use our network as quickly as possible. And as time goes on, we'll continue to build out the network such as the shared pass. And you would notice from that diagram, the shared pass come after that. So we see that as, as a lesser priority, recognizing that there already are shared paths. Um, and so we're not talking about taking those away, they're already there, um, but it'd be anything new. And I think that kind of covers too, just while you're there, Drew, it covers another concern that's been brought up about um, e-bikes and sharing cycleways, the shared pathways with e-bikes. There's a conflict there. E-bikes tend to go quickly. Um, and, and there's a concern that, that someone fears for their children's safety, having to work with and cross over uh, people on e-bikes. Um, how are we going to work through that? Claire? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Darren. That's a really good question and one that comes up a lot. On shared paths, um, as Drew said, that's a secondary network. And this strategy is actually allowing people who would prefer to go quickly and are potentially causing issues on shared paths that want to go quickly to feel safe on the road. So we know that a lot of people who are using shared paths and going quickly on them would act, feel unsafe on the roads as they are currently. And actually having a, a safe network on the road will take some of that burden off the shared paths and allow them to be used more freely by pedestrians. But also bearing in mind that this is an etiquette issue and part of the education and campaign that we're planning as one of the actions of the strategy is actually working on teaching people uh, shared path etiquette and making sure that everybody understands um, how that works and who has priority. So pedestrians do have priority on shared paths because they are more vulnerable. Okay, and and that, that, sorry, you carry on. Yeah, I see, the, I see the question there about it, especially around Richmond School. Yeah. And yeah, and you know, there's a lot of factors to that. One of one of them is that that section of Church Strait is a really key link between uh, the settlement of Berryfield and Richmond West and the town center and the rest of Richmond. So, and also that is a key school route because the children living in that area of Richmond will need to um, be able to get to Richmond school safely. And we want to be able to provide a really safe way for them to walk or scooter or bike to school. If also, I'm oh, sorry, carry on. Sorry, sorry. Just did one, one last point there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's currently a road. So you're already having an issue with vehicles driving through there at, you know, on that bit of road that cuts between the two parts of the school. But if that were to be a cycleway, uh, pedestrians, those children would still have priority. So we would expect the children to have priority over cyclists coming through, over the e-bikes coming through, just as we would, it wouldn't be safer for children, for cars to stop for the children crossing the road. So yeah, so we're definitely keeping that in mind and everything we're planning is the safety of children. Okay, great, thanks for that. Just the, another query here is about the separated cycle lanes. Um, uh, are all separated cycle lanes intended to be two-way strips on one side of the road or will there be one way on one side, one way on the other? And also the blue lines on the map, are they indicative of which side the lanes will be on those roads or how's that going to shape up, Drew? Yeah, um, so just remembering this is a strategy. So it is a high level and we what we're showing here is that we want to use this route uh, as that separated cycle lane. The, the final detail of what we put in there will be really subject to what the road environment is like. And that's that's kind of why I showed a picture, but said, hey, look, just, just be aware that every road is slightly different. So it will take a slightly different approach. Um, we, we would like to have a, a cycleway on both sides of the road, but that might not be possible in every situation. So it would be really much on a case by case basis. So with regards to your which side of the blue line 
is correct. It just happens that we're trying to squeeze a blue line and an orange line together. So that's indicative. Still a work in progress, a major work in progress. That's why we need submissions. That's why we need input from people who are here tonight. That's that's the key category of it. Um, there are a couple of other questions that are, are rolling in, and I've just got to work hard to keep up with them. Uh, when you say that cyclists have as much right to lanes and slow speed share spaces like Richmond Centre, the implication is are the places cyclists have lower rights? Is, is that what you mean? Uh, as a cyclist and a driver, I don't agree that cyclists have a lower rights on the road. Should we share it equally? Equally, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, clear. Yeah, that, that's also a really good question. So we, we have to look at this also with just a, a, a bit of an air of pre being practical as well. And we know that we're not going to be able to lower speeds to a safe speed, which is 30 to 30 kilometers an hour or lower on all our roads everywhere. Um, so we are picking those areas such as residential areas in the town center to lower the speeds so that cyclists feel comfortable and are safer cycling with traffic. However, cyclists do have the right to be on the road everywhere. Um, they are considered um, just as had to have just as much on the road as everyone else. The issue is that it's not it's not safe. Um, vehicles are much faster and heavier than cycle than bikes and it's just not as safe and that's why we're saying we need to have a separated cycle way not because they don't have rights but because that's what's safer okay yeah thanks for that now i'm, I'm just I'm scrolling through the question and answers a fair few people have actually made statements uh rather than ask questions which was a, a good thing and it's worthwhile putting into your submissions on on our document um the questions have uh finished this uh, with a vision on a transport system and a strong emphasis on road infrastructure, it doesn't really seem to cover the whole range of aspects. Uh, isn't travel by people, necessary trips and freight, the key rather than restricting the focus of the transport system, e.g. town centre parking, facility car parts, etc., uh, are, uh, are places that cyclists and pedestrians also travel through and need to be safe and have uh, attractive bike parking. That did actually cover a hell of a lot in there. And I'm not sure what the question was there. I'm sorry, I read it as it rolled through. Um, there, there are quite a few questions here. Um, Claire, is there anything that I've glossed over there? You're also covering this and monitoring the questions here. Is there anything in there specifically that you'd like to cover off? Yeah, I'm just having a re read of it myself, sorry. It's, it's rolling um, rather fast. Is necessary while, while they're doing that, uh, can I just talk a little bit to that? Look. Um, yeah, we recognise that transportation networks is more than just walking and cycling. Uh, uh, I think the comment, I haven't seen the comment, but the comment talks about freight, and yes, freight is a big part of that. Our vehicles are a big part of that and will continue to be a big part of that. Um, so we are really looking at one aspect of it. We haven't even talked about public transport other than bus stops. Um, so there, there's all these things into it. What we're recognising with this walking and cycling strategy is that we have done very little in the way of investing in this area uh, over the years. And so it's something that we, we actually want to put a strategy around that we haven't had previously to give it a shot in the arm. Um, we've, we've had public transport, albeit a, in a, a small area in our district for a little bit longer, and we have certainly had uh, access to general traffic and, and trucks and freight vehicles for quite some time. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Drew. I, I think we need to wrap it up now. We're, we're running out of time actually on this. Um, there, there is one vague question here. Um, are you anti-cars? Uh, I don't think it's anti-cars at all. I, I feel it's we need to work together as, as a transport solution. It's not my position. I'm a communications guy. But what do you guys reckon? Uh, Drew, can you can you answer that clear? Maybe you can wrap it up. Is, yeah, is this anti-car? No, it, it's certainly not. And look, we totally recognise that cars are going to be for a long time um, a big part of our, our, our transportation networks, just like I was talking about. Um, it's not anti-car at all. It's, it's actually just trying to balance the system. At the moment, unless you have a car and unless you have a driver's licence, uh, your options are very limited. And what we're trying to do is give people options. Now, the way to do that will take um, some of the... Uh, some of the things that, that general traffic and cars have had for quite some time now and, and reprioritize it uh, away from them. 
So it's not it, it's not anti car, and, and yeah, as I said, we're, we're still going to cater for cars. We're not taking car parks out of town centres, uh, but there's some aspects that will have to change. And if I could just add one more comment to that, I, this, I really see this as a win-win strategy um, for both cyclists and car drivers. We know that some people will need to drive or are always going to need to drive, but actually if we can get more people onto bikes who are able to and want to and get kids walking themselves safely to school and that kind of thing, that will actually free up space on the road network for people who do need or just want to drive, um, which is fine. And, you know, as we see more and more growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years in Tasman, if we're not looking at how we change, how we get around, or some of us change how we get around, then our roads are going to be so congested um, that it's it's not going to be any good for drivers either. So, you know, as Drew said, this is not anti-car. We're looking at actually just trying to make um, our transport network work for everybody over the coming years. Thanks, guys. I, I hope that satisfied some of the questions and some of the comments. And it's also helped form your submissions who have been here tonight attending this. Uh, we really need your input on this. You're, someone once famous said it, it's not going to happen overnight, but it might happen with your input and it's not going to happen tomorrow it's 30 years out it's 10 years out it's it's piece by piece it's a it's a little bite by bite uh, exercise but um hey who am i to say that look thanks guys drew claire really appreciate your time tonight and for the people who attended tonight really appreciate your input your questions and thank you for coming um submission deadlines do close four o'clock on monday march 7th so please do get them in. You can do them online or the uh, the other way is doing it in writing and drop it off at our service centres around uh, Richmond, Nelson, uh, Richmond and the entire Tasman district and our libraries as well. So thanks very much. And, and for me, Darren Palmer from the communications team at Tasman District Council, uh, Drew Bryant and uh, Claire Scott, we appreciate your time tonight and um, please make your submission, make your voice heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. All. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.